Okay, well, hello everyone. This is Marika from Herosphere, and today I am super excited because we're talking to Susan Clinton, who is a physical therapist from just outside Pittsburgh, isn't it, in Pennsylvania? Yes. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the suburbs. And um, we're going to be talking about sex. So I'm going to try really hard not to blush, and I'm sure Susan is going to try very hard to make me blush. And, um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome, Susan. Thanks for chatting to me today. Thank you. It's kind of interesting to be able to talk from across the large ponds of water. Yeah. Like we were in the same living room together. Technology is an awesome thing. We're literally across the other side of the world because we're 12 hours apart. This yep. works well. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just going to run through a little bit of your background, Susan, and you can just tell me if, I've, if my research has let me down. So you've had a background in originally neurology and then you went into private practice and you had a private practice in New Orleans before Hurricane Katrina, is that right? Mm -hmm. And then you moved to um, Pennsylvania and since then doing some lecturing at university level, running your own private practice, women's health and orthopedics, and then also traveling the globe, teaching courses to physiotherapists. Is that correct? That's pretty much correct. Uh, the time that I was in New Orleans, um, I was also working, I was on faculty at LSU. So my practice was centered around the faculty practice there. But yes, that's pretty much what, my sorry, travels. What's that, which, what's you, which university is LSU? That, that would be Louisiana State University. Louisiana State. Perfect. And um, recently you've done a couple of podcasts on the Pelvic Health Podcast. Well, it was one mega podcast that turned into two. Uh, mm -hmm. which was absolutely awesome. And you were dropping knowledge bombs all over the shop. I'm sure there were physical therapists just sitting there writing notes and going, oh my gosh, this is amazing stuff. Uh, and for those that are in Australia, we're trying to get Susan, hopefully, to come down under at some point and maybe run a course. So if that's of interest to you, make sure you email her and, you know, give some unsubtle hints or drop a, drop a note on Facebook to say, yes, please, we would like you to come down. I would uh, love to come. <laughs> Yeah, come in the summer or in the well, spring. We'll make, we'll, make, we'll make Perth our first stop. Yay! Come there to you Perth. go. Stay with me. I've got, I've got plenty of room. Before we crack on with the questions, tell us something, Susan, that maybe people wouldn't know about you. Well, that's kind of interesting because I don't think anybody down there really down there, like <laughs> probably down under from here. So you probably laugh at us because you're on top of your world, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I, what people probably don't know is that I grew up in Texas mm -hmm. and um, you know that in the United States that's like a whole other country and um, so I'm, I'm kind of a multinational to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, I married a, a guy from uh, Wisconsin and Michigan whose dad happened to be Canadian so I've got a pretty strong Canadian connection and um, one of the things that I like to do in my spare time is um, since I'm living up in the the upper Midwest is I'm learning to fly fish. Oh, awesome. So that's mm -hmm. when you, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Yep. It's pretty physical, isn't it? Yeah, well, you can move legitimately. My whole life growing up, it was like, don't move, don't talk, don't do anything, <laughs> just sit there. Most boring thing in the world. And then I saw anglers um, here in the Pittsburgh area, and it's like, I have to do that. I can do that. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm not very good at it, but I have a lot of fun. I was going to say, have you been successful? Have you caught anything? little bitty fish okay nothing big but it's but it's it's fun not I'm enough, good not enough to take home for dinner that's all right not, not yet <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's crack on Susan so my first question like we're going to talk about sex and I'm thinking I'm going to try not to break into some salt and pepper let's talk about sex baby but I can't help myself because you know I'm a I'm a child of the 90s um but I want to start with talking about sex in pregnancy so I think most people are aware that you know, sex is fine in pregnancy unless you have some specific um, obstetric conditions like issues with the cervix or if there's been any um, leaking of um, fluid or anything like that. But is there anything that you think women need to watch out for in terms of sex and pregnancy? And if we could talk a little bit maybe about positions, positions maybe to avoid and ones that um, you would give the thumbs up to. Right, right. So um, in, in the States, we call ourselves physical therapists. I know in Australia, you all are physios, but I'll, I'll speak in physio terms. Um, since, we are, since we are physios, I think, you know, the medical profession has the, you know, the medical reasons to not have sex pretty well covered. You know, if you're bleeding, if you're spotting, if you're leaking, if something isn't right, yeah. that belongs out of our clinic and belongs in the clinic of the medical, you know, the, the physician uh, and midwives world. Um, so, but the other piece of it that belongs with us is the, is the orthopedic world or the, the movement world. 
and you know people want to enjoy intimacy throughout mm -hmm. their pregnancy and there really really is not any reason on this earth why they shouldn't be able to do that unless there's a medical complication yeah so the question always becomes you know is it going to be uncomfortable uh, is it is you know if i'm in this position is my baby going to get hurt um you know what's going to happen to my back I, am i allowed to have an orgasm um you know if if he nudges me and gets close and suckles my breast am i going to start spewing milk everywhere <laughs> I mean, there's a lot there's you know but yeah. these are real questions, these are real questions. That absolutely have. And they don't know what they don't know who to ask or, or kind of how to do that. So they kind of just, you know, we as females, we just talk to our friends, right? And our and our mothers and our grandmothers and we get a lot of misinformation that way. We get a lot of lovely information that way. We get a lot of misinformation too. You know, yeah. like, oh, you should never lay on your back to have sex because that could cause your legs to go numb or you know, you would you should really like not do it in this position because you could you know, poke too hard against your cervix. I, all of that basically is pretty much bunk. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to kind of consider is that, it, you know, what pregnant women are very active females and should be very active females throughout their pregnancy. And my goodness gracious, if they've already had children and they're pregnant again, how are they going to be careful and quiet? You know, pregnant that you raising a family is a contact sport. Yeah. There's no question about it. You know, little children are wonderful and they're going to jump and they're going to pull and they're going to hang and they're going to run at you like a ballistic missile. Yep. And those are all very important, you know, activities of daily living as far as I'm concerned for a young mother. But I think that, you know, people get cautious when they're, when I think what happens is, is when they begin to worry about the unknown or they begin to worry about pain. Yeah. And pain is kind of the real issue that we have here, right? Mm -hmm. When I do this and I'm pregnant, it really hurts, such as, you know, the pelvic girdle pain or the pain around your pelvis, mm -hmm. you know, down the deep part of your low back could be into your hips, maybe, you know, right in the middle of your back. And um, I see a lot of clients who have oftentimes a little discomfort up in the mid part of their back, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the upper back in their rib cage area. And that's because things are moving and changing and sometimes they get into a little position or they maybe bend and twist and things get a little bit uncomfortable. But the fear is, is that something bad is wrong with the pregnancy when that occurs. Yes. And generally those are just normal aches and pains that, you know, any physio should be able to um, help you with and work out. Um, so, the, you know, you know, just because you got in a position and it hurts a little bit does not mean that something has gone wrong with your pregnancy. Yeah. So it's first, really first trying hard not to catastrophize in your mind that right. you know, what I've done has done damage to me or the baby. Right. And that's easy to do when you're responsible for more than one life, <clears throat> you know, and I totally understand that. Um, but, you know, the idea here is, is, you know, to kind of, you know, change a few of the, change a few of the, you know, myths out there um, that number one, you shouldn't have sex with pregnancy. And there's really no reason why, it, again, like because of a medical reason. But number two, that your musculoskeletal system, which is your bones, your ligaments, your joints, your nerves, all your, your connective tissue, all of that stuff is okay. It may be a little bit more movable right now mm -hmm. because of hormone changes and you're growing a baby, so your abdomen is changing at a rapid rate. Um, but but it's it, you know it's good. You're set for that. You know we're genetically engineered for that, and so it's it's really not an issue to um, hold back from that when you're going to be going to yoga or walking or running or are doing all the other thousands of things that we want people to continue in their pregnancy and be healthy and happy. Fantastic. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. We're not ill when we're pregnant. We're not broken. You know, right. we're just going through some changes. We're growing a person. Things do change. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we, we probably are often too conservative in pregnancy. We're trying to hold people back and stop them from doing anything, heaven forbid. Uh, where, but life, um, actually, it's funny you're saying about toddlers, because one of my ladies in my Pilates class yesterday had a three-year-old and she was in a position and he literally just came and jumped and dive bombed on her back. Mm -hmm. um, and hurt her and it was just so unpredictable um nothing she could do about it but yeah they're reckless little reckless little boys mm -hmm. but it's silly to think that you you know you shouldn't engage in activities because you might get bumped or bruised when 
you know, you're dealing with toddlers or little children or, or even your job may be physical. Um, there shouldn't be any reason to have to be secluded to the back room or to the side room just because you happen to be pregnant. I think it's kind of funny. The, the, um, there was a few cartoons that spread around the states here on Facebook for a while. And one of them was um, looking at the, the, the guy rushing to, the, to the, fe the pregnant female's aid. Let me help you carry this. Let me get the door for you. Let me do these things. And, and her response to him was, where were you six months ago before this all happened to me? You know, but you're in a condition now. And she was like, what condition? And then, and then behind her, like three little children all pulling things apart and grabbing things and jumping around and everything else. <laughs> it, was just, it was very, it was very, you know. Yeah. Thank I you, think, kind sir, but. <laughs> right. I think, I think kind of, you know, kindness and, and um, historically we've always been like, oh, you're pregnant, have a seat. Oh, you're pregnant. You know, it's okay. I'll take care of this. Oh, you're pregnant. And really it's actually the opposite. It's like, oh, okay, well, you let me know what you need. You know, mm. what kind of support do you need? Basically is what we should be saying to them rather than, oh, you shouldn't be doing anything. It's more like, no, what do you need help? What kind of you know, support do you have? Are you okay? What's going on? I did actually have a, I remember a patient I had in London. I was, I can't remember how pregnant I was. I was about six or seven months and, but I, I wasn't showing very big and I was demonstrating some Pilates exercises on a fit ball. And I was, you know, I, like I was a very fit before pre-pregnancy and I was doing, I was teaching through pregnancy. I was fine. And I was, I had my feet on a ball and I think I was doing like a, a pike kind of thing. And I mentioned that I, I just mentioned I was pregnant. I was going on maternity leave because I was going back to Australia and he was horrified. I mean, he said, get off, <laughs> off the ball, get off the ball. No, no, no. Okay. I've got it. I've got it. You don't need to demonstrate. And I was, I'm, I'm fine. I'm a professional. I have no issues. I'm good. And he, he said, no, no, I can't, I can't watch you do that. Get off, please, please, please. You're making me really uncomfortable. Um, mm. And so I, yeah, I had to get off. I was like, no, seriously, I do know, I do know my body and I know my limitations and it's, it's mm -hmm. okay. But he was quite mortified for that. Um, we'll move on from to the next question. And this was actually from, there was a really interesting conversation on the, the Women's Health Facebook page. And I know that you're a, a regular contributor to that too, uh, which is amazing page. I think we've got four and a half thousand physical therapists on that it's now. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy wonderful. Yeah. And, and such amazing support and sharing ideas. Um, and one of the conversations came up about around Braxton Hicks um, after orgasm. So one of the okay. physicians was asking, you know, what, what do we do about it? Is this normal? And, and I actually remember having it when I was pregnant and it felt, it was almost like one side of my abdomen where the baby was turned into a bit of a hard football. And it was really quite mm -hmm. firm. Mm -hmm. And then it would just kind of resolve within a few minutes. So what, what's mm -hmm. your sort of take on that? Like what, what causes it? And is there anything we need to worry about? Well, first of all, it's nothing you need to worry about. Braxton Hicks contractions are completely normal. And, um, they're, and they're, they're a way that your body uses, your nervous system basically uses to get things ready and prepared. It's almost like taking your car for a pre-exam before you go on a cross-country trip. Are the tires working well? Does this need, do we need to replace tubes? What needs to happen? It's kind of your nervous system's way of going, can we bring this stuff online? Can it work? Can it happen? Is everything going okay? You know, the baby's gotten to this side, so we need to kind of start test driving the area and making sure that things are going to come on, turn off, work in that interval type of thing. Um, since that is driven by your nervous system, when you are in the throes of passion, it is our nervous system that brings everything up to the pleasure system of our brain. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of what we call muscle experience that goes with that, you know, the muscles tighten, they get real jittery, we get, you know, and you know that in the throes of that, everything gets really rigid and tight and we're just kind of like right there. And then there's a whole falling off the cliff, you know, and shuddering and gasping and smiling and laughing and sweating. And all of those are symptoms of a, of a what we call the parasympathetic nervous system or our, 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 our automatic system that takes care of us. The one that wants us to breed and propagate the species, the one that wants to be warm and quiet and be motherly and loved and taken care of, all of those wonderful anti-stress systems that we have that, that can kick in for us. So oftentimes when we have an event like that, that really drives us, you know, to that point, and then we, you know, we have the fallout afterwards, 
because we have this system that's ready to go and is, and is you know, ready to kind of see what's happening online, oftentimes that can kind of bump up against that system because it's part of the same neurological system. It just kind of sits side by side with it. Mm -hmm. So when one system kind of gets a little bit excited and crazy, the other one kind of picks up with it too. And so oftentimes the fallout can be these Braxton Hicks contractions. Perhaps though, if you remember back with orgasm, that there are times when you can have what we call kind of muscle twitching for a while after mm -hmm. an orgasm. Those are all very normal too. It's no different than that. It's just the okay. nervous system has really got, you know, really got supercharged and it takes a while for it to kind of just settle down and sort out. And so oftentimes we'll get those types of responses following. So ladies, don't panic. It's all good. Keep yes. doing what you're doing. Keep doing what it's you're doing. It's a good thing. <laughs> Okay, we are going to talk now about after the baby's born. So a lot of women okay. want to know, and I think, unfortunately, it's not something that is necessarily covered by obstetricians or GPs, is sex after, mm -hmm. after delivery. You know, um, so a lot of women will have a six-week check and might be a little bit of a quick check of stitches and then sent on their way. I don't know how it is in the US. Maybe they're a little bit more thorough. They'll tend to talk a little bit about birth control, um, and that might be about the extent of it. But I don't think women get a lot of advice as to, you know, when should you start going mm -hmm. back into having intercourse and, and what sort of things can help make it a more pleasurable experience? Because obviously we don't want to be coming back into it and experiencing it in a negative way um, because then the, the repercussions mm -hmm. of that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of, I know time frames are difficult because that's a how long is a piece of string kind of question, but just to give us some guidelines would be, would be mm -hmm. awesome. Well, I, th I think the first guideline is we have to look at the tissue. You know, for any woman who has experienced even a C-section or vaginal birth, their tissues changes. Yeah. You know, they either had a surgical interruption of tissues or in a vaginal birth, they may have had tearing or they may have had a surgical interruption of the tissue. In the States, we do a lot of episiotomies. And, you know, they go through, they'll, they'll actually cut right through the muscle to prevent it from tearing. Yeah. And then they'll go back and do, you know, the, you know, the uh, reconstruction, stitching and pulling everything back together. Are they, are they so, being done sort of a bit more routinely? Because I know they've gone a little bit out of fashion in Australia. It's, it's, it's if, unless people are really, you know, um, advocating for themselves, for, there's, still a, there's still a great deal of episiotomy stuff. Wow, okay. Yeah, they really are. Um, you know, and again, I, it, it, you know, I think the risk of all of that depends on your zip code. You know, where, where you know, <laughs> whatever you yeah. call them in, in Australia, but yeah. where you live is going to determine kind of what, you know, because that's who, the, that's who the physicians are and the kinds of things that they do. And Pittsburgh, we're seeing more and more uh, um, midwives that are very involved in doulas and um, changing of birth positions, which can also protect perineal tissue, yep. um, which are all good things, but the issue mm. isn't really, really kind of how you had the baby. What happened when you had the baby? Mm. So I, like I said, the first thing we have to look at is tissue. We have to give time, tissue needs time to heal. Mm. That, I mean, in a nutshell, that's it. It's basic biology and physiology. If you have a cut on your arm, it's going to take a certain amount of time for all of the chemistry and all of the stuff that goes on to begin to knit that wound back together and give it strength and, and protect it from tearing open again. That, I mean, that's just, there, that's just time. And that's making mm -hmm. sure that the inflammatory system and the repair system is all online and working really well. Yep. Um, so, so we do have that. So there is that period of time right after, it doesn't matter if you tear, it doesn't matter if you have stitches, it doesn't matter you know, if they decided to open your abdomen and, you know, little bitty, you know, and, and close it back up, you still have to have time for that to heal. And so I encourage everybody to remember that, you know, it's going to be in normal physiology, it's going to be about 10 to 12 days. You know, that, I mean, to get past that stage one healing where everything kind of comes back together and it begins to knit that scar together. And I think that that's appropriate to kind of consider that. Most people realize at that time that they may be quite vulnerable and are not willing to entertain the idea of intercourse. Um, people have vaginal exams all the time right after the birth of their children, mm -hmm. but that's a very different thing than a big, you know, engorged penis, you know, pressing its way through, um, you know, because the doctor can certainly take his fingers 
then stay up by the pubic bone and move and check yeah. scar, you know, because they can go in easily, check the scar tissue, make sure everything's okay. Yeah. You know, they certainly don't insert speculums at that point in time unless they need to, if they suspect an infection or something else or things that maybe they need to go in and do further repair on. But, you know, for the most part, um, for people who are just recovering, I think it's, it's pretty easy to say that you just need to let that tissue heal. And that yeah. takes a couple of weeks. You know, you know I, I was quite surprised when you said 10 to 12 days, because I was thinking, you know, historically people say, you know, six weeks, give it six weeks. Right. Uh, do, you know, do you come across many patients keep <laughs> have sex at 10 to 12 days postnatal? Well, I, that, that's step number one in the process of the healing thing. So 10 to 12 days. Because Sorry, I was, I'll, let, I'll let you keep going. No, no, that's, that's good. It's a great question because I will bring that up because there is that magic six week mm. thing that goes on out there. Um, the reason I bring up 10 to 12 days is because one of the biggest things people want to ask about is protection. You know, should I be using ice? Should I be using pressure? And I think that in across the globe, if you look at the way women are cared for in different cultures, and then you look at the culture of the United States, we tend to just send people home. We don't even give them an ice pack and just kind of get them to figure and sort it out. I, I'm a big believer that you need to get you know, a pair of compression underwear mm -hmm. to put on after you have the baby. You need a little compression and support for your abdominal tissue because somebody has just popped that giant balloon. And you know, I mean, things were like, big and they were strong and you know the baby was in there and then all of a sudden it's gone i mean it's like popping a balloon so the tissue the abdominal tissue needs support mm -hmm. but also the perineum needs support too you know particularly if you're going to be in the upright position and what new mother isn't going to be yeah right they're going to be That's breastfeeding right. they're going to be putting the baby down picking the baby up changing diapers doing all of those different things that need to be done and that you know that area for healing needs the same thing that we would do for any other area that had stitches and you know swelling and pain we would do you know and I think the newest guidelines for what is it rice which is rice uh, rest, rest compression, elevation. Yeah, ice, yeah. compression and elevation now they're just saying it's really the compression more than anything and maybe the elevation and that the you know the the ice part isn't that important but ice is really nice because it nice really can be a, yeah the pain yeah. it's it's sensational for that so whether or not it helps with the swelling, who cares? Yeah. If it makes you feel better, do it. Go for it. <laughs> Harmless. But the, the compression underwear are great because you can use whatever ice. If, if you want to use uh, frozen peas, it's all going to be fine. You, you know, put them in a Ziploc bag or, you know, you can put a washcloth around them and put them there. But in the meantime, you're going to need some other sort of compression when you're up and moving around. So you may mm -hmm. not be walking around with an ice pack between your legs. Yeah. That may be just for your you know, kind of like, okay, I'm a little achy and sore. I'm going to sit on some ice for a while or lay, lay and put some ice on my perineum for a while. But I think that, you know, and we don't have to spend a lot of money on it. Get a good pair of compression underwear and get a couple of, of menstrual pads and put, you're going to be bleeding anyway, and yep. put them on, put an extra one underneath there if you need to, and pull those, the, that underwear on and get a little bit of support for your perineum mm -hmm. while it's in its healing stage. Absolutely. And I think, you know, yeah, and those are those are easy, easy, easy things to do that you don't need a lot of fancy equipment. You don't need to have, you know, ultrasound through balloons. You don't need to do, you know, you, you don't, you don't, you don't need, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But the point is, is that it's just basic first aid. Yeah. You know, you've got an injury and, you know, that has been occurred because of childbirth and it needs to be treated as such. Yeah. You know, if you, if somebody um, opened your knee up for surgery, what would they be doing for it? They'd be putting compression on it. They would be putting ice. They would be teaching you how to do compression. Mm -hmm. They would be supporting the tissue through those next 10 to 12 days while it goes through that initial healing phase. Yeah, absolutely. After that, then we can go after and start working on the scar, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they say, okay, well now they're past that, that, you know, those 10 days or 12 days or 14 days. So we've got that time. You know, I usually just tell people two weeks. Yeah. It's easier to remember than a number. And once we get them past that stage, then we can start doing some stuff because this is the thing they tell that, you know, they will say you can't do anything for six weeks. So my question is always, well, what does that mean? Mm. Does that mean you can't lift for six weeks? Maybe if you've After had a baby, section, <laughs> that may be the, that may be the case, mm. but how is she going to pick up her baby and take mm. care of her baby? So, 
we've got to sort that all out. The other piece of it is, is that, you know, is this person not going to get up and walk across the room to go to the bathroom? Is this person not going to have a bowel movement? Yeah. Which is stretching and changing of the tissues. And that occurs even in the healing stage, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We need to have that happening right away. Don't want anybody getting constipated. constipated. You know, no, no, bad. no, no. Bad. No, bad. So, um, you know, all of these things are going to occur. Let's just give people the support that they need through it. And then once they get rolling, I think it's, I think it's actually okay for them to start to do different things. They're going to get on the floor, stretch a little bit, move, get on your hands and knees, play with your baby, sit back on your feet, you know, do some different movement patterns and, you know, just be careful and pay attention to your yeah. body. See how you feel. And I think, yeah, and see exactly, see how you feel. Um, learn where your scar is. One of the things that I do, if I'm lucky enough to have some people in during the prepartum stage, is I always spend a little time with them, talking to them about what's going to happen after your baby comes, and when can you start doing scar massage and some different things, and I'll coach them through that. Yep. Because if they're coming to me for pelvic girdle pain, pre-pregnancy, I'm certainly going to give them the information on perineal massage to get ready for birth. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, all absolutely. part of the, it's all part of the pelvis as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, so we want to, you know, keep all those things in mind. So they need to get comfortable, you know, touching their That's perineum amazing. and making sure that, you know, how does it feel? How does it smell? You know, the first sign of infection is something kind of smells not right. Yep. Not that everybody's going to have an infection at all, but, you know, it's just, it's just kind of paying attention, you know, to what's going on. And, you know, when the compression doesn't feel uncomfortable anymore, when you feel like you can sit on the floor and it's not uncomfortable, that maybe it's okay to kind of explore, you yeah. know, um, return to intimacy with your, with your mate, you know, whether it's a female or a male. I mean, you know, and you don't maybe have to have full blown, you know, intercourse, you know, at that point, but you can certainly, you know, return to touch and return to, you know, intimacy and many other different natures. And there's certainly no harm in being brought to orgasm without penetration. Yeah. So, um, so I, think so I, I love this process that you're talking about, Susan, because it sounds to me very sensible rather than throwing an arbitrary date at it. We're talking mm -hmm. about almost gradual exposure, you know, just mm -hmm. gentle movement, see how you feel, a bit of touch, a bit of massage, you know, start with a bit of intimacy, exactly. gently see how you feel. And then that's really again, stopping women from going back into intercourse with, oh, geez, that's, because, yep. you know, that's oh what God, I often God, hear. That's, that's when it's over. Yeah. And yeah. then what happens when you're sore is, of course, everything tenses mm -hmm. and tightens. And, you know, we, we want to be relaxing that pelvic floor and letting everything go. Right. And being able to return to that, to that moment. I think there's, you know, and, and that's, that's an interesting point when we talk about, you know, the whole tensing and tightening up and everything is I think one of the things that um, new moms certainly and experienced moms need to remember is that, or couples need to remember is that, you know, when we return to intimacy, we're returning to intimacy in a place where perhaps may be the work zone for the mother at that moment. If she's in her room and she's nursing in her room and she's caring for the baby somewhere next to her room, and things like that, that, that may have a little bit of a value conflict for some people like, Oh, mm. I don't, you know, it's all babies right there. Kids are next door. Yeah. Kind of a little too much realism where, you know, it's not, it may not be something that the partner thinks about as much, especially if they're working and not at home. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're actively engaging, of course, hopefully, but it still may not be something that they, you know, it's like, you know, and I, I think, I don't know about female partners, but I think for guys, having sex in their office is kind of a turn on. So maybe to them, they don't do that at all. But, <laughs> but you know, for, for females, it's kind of, you know, the place where she's caring for her children and doing yeah. things. And so, you know, I think that's why that graded kind of coming together work is so lovely and so wonderful because they can figure out where's the best place for returning to intimacy for us, cool. you know, and if they go slow and they're careful and they're, and they're just working through that as she feels better. And as you know, they can get together. Then I think it's a little bit easier when you finally get to the act of, of, of intercourse. I don't have the statistics in front of me, but one of the things that I know that they have out there is, you know, I think almost, 80% of women return to intercourse long before the six week mark that the, really? 
OB has given them. So whether because they want to or they need to or yeah. whatever. So this goes to show how important it's, it's it is. Occurring, it's occurring a lot earlier than six weeks. You know, most of the, yeah, I, I know that they say the six week mark and yeah. even in the States, they will say, well, I don't want you going to physical therapy until you're at the six week mark. And it's oh, like, okay. what is our pelvic floor doing for that four weeks between the healing phase and the six weeks? I mean, is it just gonna, what's happening there? You know? Um, what if they're not pooping? What if they're leaking? Yeah, oh my gosh. You know? so, yeah, so I mean, and then if those things occur, you know, of course, if they're having like fecal incontinence or urinary incontinence yeah. and, the, and the woman's hysterical enough, then they'll send her to, and at least they do in the States, they'll either send her to PT or they'll send her, at least send her to a urogynecologist. Right, okay. Right, you know, yeah, so. I, um, I think there is a little bit of that here, you know, um, people get discharged from the hospital and then they might see like a maternal health nurse maybe come a, a couple of times at home. And then there's really not a lot between then and that six week mark. And that's why I, in my classes, you know, I'm very big on education. Into mm -hmm. the, these are the things that you need to know about in that early postpartum um, phase. You know, these are the things you can, right. can be doing. And if any of these things flag up, go get help, get help sooner right. rather than later. The longer you leave it often, the harder it is to manage. Um, just mm -hmm. taking it back to um, sex again, uh, in terms of lubrication, do you recommend lubrication the first few times? Um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I sure do. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> there we go. That's awesome. That could be, that could be a brand name. Yeah, but new word. I, I, I do. And um, I'll be very honest with you. I, I don't like anything that is, um, I don't like anything with fragrances. Mm-hmm because those can be irritable. Yep. And I don't like a whole lot of, I don't like the bottles that have all of the writing all over them. If you look at the ingredients, it should be very, very, very simple. It should have one or two things in there. And if it's got some sort of oxy something other blah, 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 you know what I'm talking about, yeah, the 15 yeah. letter words, you don't need to put that on yourself because the best lubricant you have is probably sitting in your pantry. Yeah. And it's called olive oil. <laughs> And it's wonderful and it's natural and it'll work wonders for your scar. I mean, it's amazing. Some people like coconut oil. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful too. You just need to kind of bring the coconut oil out and maybe just where it's not so solid. So it gets a little bit more, you know, just kind of maybe warm it up a little bit or leave it out for a little yeah. bit. So it kind of gets warm or put it in a little warm water, like a double, you know, like in your sink, you can put, you know, take a little bit, put it in a baggie and put it in the, the sure. sink. So it, up a little bit so lovely to use yep. and nothing better for skin and healing and scars and all of that kind of stuff so I think natural is good if people don't want to do anything like that and they really want to have a different kind of lubricant there are some wonderful ones out there they're more water-based and you just want to what I tell people to do if you want to know if a lubricant is the right one for you take it squirt it between your fingers and rub it for a while mm -hmm. For a while, not for, not for <laughs> a half a minute, not for 30 seconds. You need to rub it for a while because that's how, think about how long sex lasts. Yeah. And if it starts getting gummy or, you know, kind of starts getting tacky or weird, yeah. it's probably not the lubricant for you because that's what's going to be rubbing yeah. against your really sensitive tissues. Yeah. And so I'll tell people, you know, just pick up the olive oil and put it between your fingers for a while and see how it feels. Mm -hmm. You know, if it feels good, it the nice thing about olive oil is it doesn't smell. Yeah. You know? And it's not going to leave, you know, things that you can't wash out of your sheets later. And that's um, what I recommend for perineal massage is olive oil. Is that what you recommend as well? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. It's just, it's easy. It's readily yeah. available. And, it's there. you know, even, even people who are financially challenged can get a hold of olive oil. Sure. You know, so that, you know, it's so much better to find, you know, we're lucky now these days where you can really find that stuff, you know, that's just very generic everywhere, which is great. I think, I think we buy in like the five litre drums and then pour <laughs> in the containers. Um, in terms of people who have more uh, perineal, I hate, I hate to use the word damage, but let's say that someone has a third or a fourth degree tear. Now they're still okay. predominantly dissolvable, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, all, all the same things that you've talked about will, will basically apply to those who have a third or fourth degree tear? 
Absolutely. Yeah. The other thing that we that you need to worry about are people. Oh, sorry, need to worry actually, about- sorry. Before you answer that, just can you just clarify because some people might not know what a third or fourth degree tear is. I oh, sure. That so, um, we have a we have a, a, a piece of tissue that sits between our vagina and our rectum. And you can go right down to your vagina and you can touch your vagina, your opening, and go just south of that before you get to your rectum and you'll feel that nice big bridge of tissue there. And that's our, it's called, technically it's called our perineal body. Mm-hmm. What makes that very important is it's a, it's a nice separation between um, the two orifices. But the also, the, the backside of that is, is that's where our anal sphincter lives. Mm-hmm. And we have the outside anal sphincter, which is the part that you see, that's the little wrinkled up, little, you know, little mouth at the end of our, our poop chain, right? <laughs> and then on the inside, the inside, we have one that's, that's called the internal anal sphincter. And that's not really under voluntary control. We can control this one. You can open it up and you can close it up, you can tighten it up all of those kinds of things, but you can't do anything about the internal one. It responds to pressure from the rectum. And so sometimes people can tear and tear into that anal sphincter. And so what ends up as a result, besides, you know, of course it can be painful, but not everybody has pain with it, but there certainly can be a big scar tissue. What ends up happening is the tissue between the vagina and the rectum gets thin. And we can do one of two things if we're really constipated, we can have stool that kind of sits against that thin tissue and kind of breaks it down a little bit. So we get kind of a heaviness in the, in the, in our rectum because we're not really getting the, the um, constipated stool out or because the anal sphincter may have been damaged. We actually have a sudden urge to go right when the stool hits the anal opening right at the end of the chain there. And then it's almost too late because it's big and it's, and it's, and so oftentimes we'll, you will lose control. Mm-hmm. And if you think having a little urinary incontinence is frightening, <laughs> a new mother yeah. with loss of fecal control can be very frightening. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah, so two things need to happen. Number one, it needs to heal. Number two, we need to give time for the pudendal nerve to re-engage because sometimes with stretching with birth, that's hard enough to cause those kinds of tears. We get stretching of the nerves that go to the muscles as well. Yeah. And they need time to recover. And it takes, they have to kind of, let me see if I can put it this way. We've got fat that goes around our nerves. It's called myelin. Mm-hmm. And when nerves are injured or damaged, that myelin breaks off. And then it kind of, we call it demyelination. In other words, it loses that, but it loses it all the way back to the part up in the spine where it comes from. And then it has to, then it will remyelinate. It'll regrow that sheath that fat sheath all the way down, but it takes an inch a month. So we've got to take it, you know, so we need to learn how to kind of plan for bowel movements, you know, capture that gastric colic reflex by sitting on the commode right after you eat, mm. taking care of those things, not straining, protecting the tissues, and just allowing for that nerve regrowth to occur. And then you can really kind of, and then doing, of course, public floor muscle exercises and things once we can get things going to help bulk up the area as good as possible too. So I think, you know, for anyone listening, if you listen to what Susan's talking about, really anyone who has a third or fourth degree tear should, should be under intense supervision, well, regular supervision by a, by a physical therapist, but very early on. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think, yeah, what you're, what you're talking about, this bladder and bowel management is absolutely essential. Mm-hmm. Um, so please make sure that you do. And I know some hospitals are fantastic at it. They have what are called Oasis clinics, obstetric anal sphincter injuries. I think that's what it stands for. Um, they'll have fantastic clinics and it's very multi area. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Um, and other, other places are not so good at it. So if you don't think you're getting that level of care, uh, follow up, get referred, um, get onto it because I, you're absolutely right. It's very distressing for anybody. Um, but you know, as a new mum. Dealing with all of that, new baby, feeding, you know, adding incontinence, fecal incontinence on top of that is um, pretty disastrous, really. Um, I have one more question for you. And uh, let me just let me oh, just throw this one sorry. thing out real quick. Yep. Um, for the for the people who are listening, do not put up with urinary or fecal incontinence. Mm. It's not normal. Even if your mother told you that you've had a baby now, you're just going to have that kind of stuff happen. It may be common, but it's not normal. And there is help. Please seek it. 
Don't I put up with it. We're not going to change it till we start demanding change. And there was a, I don't know if you saw the fantastic video uh, last week. There was a, um, I think it was by Poise, you know, like one of those incontinent pads companies and they put out this big song and dance video and it was all these ladies who are all saying, oh, it's all good. You know, we all wet our pants when we sneeze or go on a trampoline. And, but there's a big, you know, you can just put your pad in and then go back to Zumba or whatever. It's like, no! <laughs> so we're, we're on a walk have, path pads here. Have re- pads have a place. Of course. And when you're, going, when you're going through training or you're changing behaviors around your urgency or frequency, you need to pad up while you get strong and you get good and you get coordinated. But they're not. That's not the end of the line. Yeah, that's not. Yeah, no. It's like, really? You're telling somebody who's 25 to just wear diapers? No. And I do. I do hear that a lot from from moms saying, "Oh, I just can't jump on the trampoline anymore. I I can't run anymore." Yeah. And you know, well, this, that's what people do. They quit moving. Yeah. They quit. They quit doing things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Big, big, big point there. Follow up. Get help. And um, there's really good evidence for pelvic floor retraining for. Mm-hmm. by physical therapist um yeah so I, I rant about that a lot so I'm, I'm with your sister get back into it um mm-hmm. and the last question i want to ask in terms of sex was um i recently had a conversation with a, a women's health physical therapist who works near me and she does uh, all my postnatal assessments because i'm not a women's health physiotherapist i'm a musculoskeletal mm-hmm. but i run exercise classes so i mm-hmm. get all my postnatal ladies to have a pelvic floor assessment first just so they know, they know where they're at and i think it's mm-hmm. really useful and if their pelvic floor is working really well and everything's working really well they get that confidence and and we can just you know start to push them a bit um but she was saying that she is finding about 25 percent of postnatal women have very overactive pelvic floor uh, mm-hmm. muscles and will have obviously discomfort with intercourse so i wanted mm-hmm. to ask do you think it's easy for people to tell the difference between discomfort and intercourse from scar tissue versus an overactive pelvic floor that's Mm -hmm. just on all the time and needs to you know learn how to relax and settle right right that's an excellent question and um the answer i don't want it to sound trite at all but the answer is if you ask the right questions you'll probably get the answers that you need Mm -hmm. so for the ladies who are listening ask yourself the following questions does this feel like i'm like i'm tearing does it feel like, you know, where is my scar? So find where your scar is. Does it feel, is it tender around your scar? That's going to be a little bit different than muscles that are just really kind of cramping and working too hard. So what's happened is that something's gone wrong in your pressure system, which is what Marika was talking about that she works on in her exercise classes. I'm sure you do breathing and all of the different things to re-coordinate all of the muscles that need to come back on as a team like you work with your women's health physio as a team mm. to make sure everybody's getting everything the right way. When you have pelvic floor muscle spasms, they're going to feel a lot different. They're not going to feel like a cut or a stretch of a, or a tenderness or, or those little tiny pinpointy tendernesses, things like you'll feel around any scar, any healing scar that you have or tissue that just doesn't feel like it moves well. It's going to feel more like muscle aching, muscle cramping, a feeling of heaviness. Um, And oftentimes with that kind of pelvic floor muscle overactivity, we can get um, a lot of referred pain into the back of the buttocks, into the back of your sacrum, which is that lower part of your spine, um, even down into the coccyx area, and also around in front, in the front of your hips, along the groin area, into those areas like that. Because those muscles, the pelvic floor muscles are very large. They sit like an inverted cup. And they have attachments all around the rim, the top part of your pelvis, as well as the under part and into the ligaments. So we can get things that seem more like back pain or hip pain, or if you've heard of SI joint pain, um, and or, you know, like I said, that deep cramping or heaviness feeling that once it gets going, it's really hard to, you know, with the, with the other pain, with the pain around the, the uh, the scar, if you stop touching it or just kind of sit Maybe quietly, it it'll, it'll like kind of, you know, ramp down. But once the muscles kind of get going and they get overstretched or they get irritated, actually, when you go to rest, you may even feel it more. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so it's very, it's, it, they're, they're two, two really different feelings, Perfect. both very, very treatable. 
you know, very treatable. But, you know, it just requires maybe, and maybe you have both. Maybe you have a little scar tissue sensitivity and you have the muscles around the scar as tend to have decided that they're going to kind of splint and be protective. So you've got a little bit of that deep ache and some of that other stuff going on as well. And then uh, another good reason to see your women's health physical therapist. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's all my questions about sex. I don't know if you, if there's anything else you wanted to add, Susan, any other tips or things that you've noticed that you think people really, really need to know about sex after babies? <laughs> I think the biggest thing is, is go with your gut. You know, if it doesn't feel right, then it's not right. This isn't about the time to please somebody, to please your partner. You need to take care of yourself. I think when we are going through our early stages of postpartum, and I'll say this with all um, due gratitude to the women who have followed me out there. I, the first year after having a baby is a time for radical self-care. Mm -hmm. It just, it really is. Yeah. And one of the things that you will model to your children is that you matter. You know, your self-care should be as important as theirs because they are going to watch every little single thing you do. And if they see that you neglect yourself and don't eat and don't do your things and, and don't take care of yourself, that they're going to learn, they're going to learn that. And that's not the, I don't think that's the message as females that we want out there for our children. We want them to be happy, healthy, self-sufficient, but also really good at self-care. And that's, you know, cause that we know that's health, right? Absolutely. And so I think when we talk about sex after, after pregnancy, it's like, go at it slow. This is the time to reconnect in a completely different way with your partner. Um, you know, again, whoever your partner may be, you know, and just take the time to really explore that and, you know, and work that into a routine that's going to feel comfortable and happy for both of you. Because, you know, as bad as they may want to re-engage and make their life seem normal again, they, they also want to take care of you as mm -hmm. much as you may want to take care of yourself. And that may be the way they know how to take care of you as they did that before. It was kind of a close, com you know, close yeah. thing that you had together and that's missing now. So it's okay to hold hands and be close and begin to explore that intimacy again before you go move right back into, you know, vaginal intercourse. What a fantastic message to finish on self-care. And I think, you know, we, as, as mums, you know, we kind of, we are sometimes martyrs, you know, we put everyone else first um, until we literally fall apart at the seams. And yes. I have quite a few friends now, my children are six and eight who are going through, they're now almost trying to catch up with the self-care and go, you know what? I've put everyone else first for so long. I'm falling apart. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm getting stressed. I'm tired. I'm having these chronic illnesses, etc. Mm -hmm. This is not good enough. If I can't look after myself, I can't look after anyone else. So if, I think, you know, if we can start that really, really early on and, mm -hmm. and let people help you, people yes. help you say, yes, please. It is not yes. a sign of weakness. Take everything, especially in those first I think, I, think it's, I definitely think it's critical. And I think, and I, I love the way that you said, let people help you. Why would you, you, cause you would help anybody in your life, right? People if don't wanted, offer if they don't mean it. They want to help right, you. Right. And, but, but, why would you deny them the same gift that you would give to them? Yeah. You know, you need to be able to accept that gift for yourself too. And it's so important because we're better together. We're all better together. Love it. Fantastic. Well, we're going to finish it up there. A massive thank you, Susan, so much for your time. Um, I'm sure, well, I've learned a lot and I'm sure um, many of my listeners will. Um, so thank you so much. You're welcome.